Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 20th, 2023, our readings are from Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1, and then verses 6 through 8. Uh, the continuous reading is Genesis chapter 45, 1 through 15. Our psalm is number 67. And our epistle is Romans chapter 11, verses 1 and 2a, and then verses 29 through 32. And we have found ourselves to the 15th chapter of Matthew. We could start with verse 10 um, through 20. Um, our assigned reading is verse 21 through 28. Um, or we could start at, at verse 10 and read all the way through. So we've, we've pointed toward this uh, 15th chapter of, of Matthew uh, a lot, huh, Matt? So here we are. I think we have been talking about it. Yeah, talking about faith and the nations and abundance in recent weeks. The, you know, the, the first 11 verses there that are optional are, well, they're hard because, you know, Matthew's made so many changes to a similar passage in Mark. I prefer Mark's passage, but it, it's, it, there's not a, there's not a really long explanation here about what's wrong with the law or what's wrong with, um, I should say what's wrong with the way people are keeping the law and certain commandments, but we do get a hint about what Jesus is upset about, this notion of, of blind guides. Um, one person, one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. I've talked about Jesus not, um, not at all happy with people who create stumbling blocks for others or people who, and this is, this is at the heart of, I think, his criticism in, in Matthew is it's not that the Pharisees with whom he contends are wrong for having high regard for the law. It's that there's something about the way they're going about it he sees as actually making religion more burdensome for others. And that's not a fault with Judaism in the abstract. That's a fault with this particular group that he sees as hypocritical in some way, shape, or form. So you yeah. just have to nuance that. If you do these verses, you really have to explain that that the Pharisees aren't people for us to hate. The Pharisees aren't people who are keepers of a dead religion. The Pharisees are people like us who are the consummate religious insiders who have somehow warped a liberating message and a liberating religion into something that um, creates burdens and, and casts others out. Mm -hmm. Which is a great sermon in and of itself, but then the poor Canaanite woman runs out of time. So yeah, 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 and I think that's maybe part of what you maybe the preacher has to decide uh, and to to give both their their due due diligence and <laughs> um, with like some of the cautions that you already mentioned, Matt, Matt, and that um, that when we're when we're looking at texts like this that this is not a condemnation of the pharisees and it's it's just it's and it's but it's and i think the you, you know the the one thing that's another direction or important aspect of this text is the where is the correlation between you know what's in your heart and your and your behavior um where it, can you you know can you draw a line between uh, and we might say that too. Like, can we draw a line between, you know, what, what we believe about God and then our, and then our outer, our outer action, our visible actions that our visible actions actually say a lot of what we think about God, even though that's not, that's not necessarily the direction that we tend to go. Right. So what we say and what we do is it very much is a, uh, is a, is a revealing of who you think God is. And uh, and and what you believe and who you believe God to be, and so and, and I think this is an important. It's an important reminder for preachers in that uh, in as leaders of congregations, are they leading from 
their theological core, or is there a disconnect? Is there a, dis, a, 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 a yeah a, a disjunction between who they believe God to be and how they are manifesting that theology in the world? And I think I think uh, a number of people, preachers included, leaders in the church included, live in a performative contradiction of who they who they believe God to be, uh, what they believe about. Uh, about faith, and then what actually gets, or we sh- and we, and then the people who have certain behaviors, we should question. Well, then who is your God? Tell me who your God is. If this is if this is what you say, and this is what you do, and this is how you act, then tell me who your God is. I really want to know, because if if there is that correlation, if there is that connection between your heart and your hands, <laughs> then then I want to know who your God is. So, so much that's, that's, that's yeah. so much of our, so much of our actions silence our words what we do um how people feel in our presence um is what they're going to remember regardless of the words of our mouth how, how they feel in, in our presence is what they're going to remember and and so in a in a um a hermeneutical move that you taught me Caroline because it's what you teach our students with John um is um right before we come up on this scene with the Canaanite woman we have this explanation that Matt was just saying and so this experience becomes moving from how a blind following of the law doesn't embody the law. And so this this context that is these first 11 verses, 10 through 20, is necessary to understand what Matthew is put totally putting in this scene with Jesus and the Canaanite woman. And to read it with that kind of generosity. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. to read it with that kind of living out because it's real clear the Canaanite woman had an understanding, um, maybe a clearer understanding than the Pharisees that are being uh, uh, criticized, than the blind leaders that are being critiqued. Here, this outsider, this woman that wasn't supposed to know, she seems to get it enough to desire it, enough to ask for it, enough to seek for it. And because of the kind of God that Jesus embodies, she gets it. But That's Jesus, has, yeah. And, but Jesus has to be, he, he has his, his moment of where he has to say, wait, yeah, what God am I embodying? <laughs> wait a minute here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I've, I've got to tell you, I, I'll tell our listeners this as a woman of color, I really need the faithfulness of Jesus, who the writer of Hebrews is going to say is without sin. I I cannot let go of racism being the ultimate sin, the ultimate display of a lack of hospitality, an ultimate denial of a full community table. And so if Jesus needs to be taught by me, the outside woman, about the God that he is supposed to embody I've got a problem with that. We were just talking about, are your actions contradicting your words? So I'm real, I I confess, I'm real generous in this reading of Jesus. Um, In this text, which um, is is probably harder than the Mark text, I don't know which one's harder, Um, but the, the idea here of Jesus knows this woman's heart and allows the gospel writer to capture it so that we can trust that God knows the ones who are seeking fully to know God, as opposed to Jesus needing God embodied in the flesh, needing God's creation to tell God that God created me good. I, I, I really, I need God to get me I don't need God to need me to tell God I'm good. Uh, so so I, I know that that's a different reading from a lot of scholars. But in my body, 
if Jesus doesn't get that, then I've got a problem with the God that Jesus is the flesh. So I, I read that very generously. Um, I almost read it like Job, that 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 God knows Job's heart better than Job knows God's heart, uh, knows his own heart. And Jesus knows just how much this woman knows this promise. And so he can test her. He can talk to her. He can question her. He can offend her because she knows that God is good. And that's who Jesus is bearing witness to. I wonder if there's a third reading as well. I mean, I appreciate yeah. that, Joy. Um, and I've written on the Mark version and, and, and then we come out in different sides, uh, yeah. which is, which is great. But um, yeah, it's typically, typically it's, it's typically the, uh, the discussions boil down to is this woman passing a test of some kind or is she changing Jesus's mind? And I, whichever one of those kind of directions you go, there's all these other side alleys too, I think you have to consider. And so, um, I wouldn't say she's necessarily changing his mind about her, her value as a human being, but she does seem to be accelerating the, the timetable perhaps, right? It's not like that. Um, and, and maybe she's got, maybe she's heard stories about the feeding of the 5,000. Maybe she knows, um, you've got a little more blessing in there than, uh, you know, that's ready to come now. It doesn't have to be first this group and then that group. That's what I mean by kind of accelerating the, the, the timetable there. Um, it, it, there are, well, of course, there's a lot of problems with this passage. I, no, I don't think any interpretation fully makes it a, a text where the preacher can go home really happy and put their feet up and say, <laughs> we figured that one out today, didn't we? But it's... But it does, um, if, there, if, if her dignity remains kind of up for negotiation, there are problems that, 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 that aren't easily explained away by, um, and because one of the more familiar ways of dealing with that has been, oh, well, everybody was racist back then. Or everybody hated Gentiles back then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It kind of implies this universal bigotry on Judaism of the first century, which is, that's probably not problematic. useful either. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'll offer this and that is that, yeah, aware of these, you know, these differing perspectives of, of who she is, but I, I kind of, this time around am reading kind of the text backwards in that uh, the woman, you know, great is your faith, which, which really then invites what is, what is faith here. Uh, and, and what, how is it she's embodying a certain kind of a, a distinctiveness about faith that we want to hold up? And what is, you know, not this sort of blind or general definition of faith, but faith here is, is a persistence. And faith here also is a, uh, is kind of a, a, a truth telling in a way, you know, here's a Canaanite woman. This is a, this is a, a a woman whose people were displaced by Israel's occupation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and she's challenging privilege. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's, there is, where is it that she's embodying a kind of faith that, uh, that is, uh, is speaking to, you know, speaking truth to uh, the dynamics of society mm -hmm. and, uh, and calling everybody to task on that. You know, whoever happens to be, <laughs> whoever happens to be there, and is 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 holding the principles of privilege, or uh, or um, you know, certain people are in and certain people are out, and so she, you know, her um, her marginalization here of being in a, Can a Canaanite in the district of Tyre and Sidon, uh, she is uh, her faith ends up being. Um, I know who my God, I know, I know what God we're talking about. And right. yeah, I know what, I know what God we're talking about. And I'm going to, I'm going to speak, I'm going to witness to that God. I love that. And I love the line you gave, Matt. Um, when I say, I love that Caroline, I love that this is about God as you in this. Um, but Matt, I love the line, the way that you put it in terms of accelerating, because so often um, one of those um, 
lines that are drawn in the sand for who the other is, has been, well, you'll get yours later. And this acceleration is to say, no, the kingdom of God is here now. And, and, and there are times when in our present political moment, we need to recognize that the peace of God is not in the pie, in the sky pie. Can't even throw, throw out the little one-liner. In the sky, pie oh, in the I sky, by and by. <laughs> Woo, yeah. There it is. Um, but when we, to, to use the words we've used earlier, uh, you used earlier, Caroline, when we actually embody this this presence of God that we are called to exhibit in our actions, not just in our words, then the people around us actually experience that now. And that, you know, Jesus is going to tell something about, I don't know, the persistent woman and a judge. There's some parable about that. And here, what is he doing? He's embodying it. He's living it out. She's persistent. And what God has always been about is received here and now. I like that. I like that. Linger in this, this. this this is this is this is not uh, as as Matt said, this isn't one where you just wipe your hands and say, I did it. If you're gonna be faithful, there's gotta be some some tension in the midst of this moment. Yeah, it doesn't it's, it's like a puzzle that's always got a few leftover pieces and you're like, where in the world did these come from? So we probably, speaking of accelerating the timeline, should talk about uh, Isaiah 56 a bit, which, uh, again, this notion of outsiders having a seat at the table is nothing new. It's not a Jesus thing. It's, this is deeply embedded there, in, 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 at least in this case, in a post-exilic vision for what kind of um, <clears throat> excuse me, what kind of nation it's going to be. I really love that Amy Oden in her commentary even brought in like Ezra and Nehemiah, which is like, oh wow, but that's the point, right? Like what's what's going on in the in, in the post-exilic society, right? What what mistakes were made before? Who are we gonna be? Who can we trust? Whom can't we trust? And a lot of people pay a price for that in Ezra and Nehemiah, but here's this Isaiah, you know, the vision of Isaiah, which is um, you know, to keep the doors open and and to imagine being the, you know, still drawing the nations into God's blessings. And, and Caroline, you began by saying that this, well, I think it was you, uh, maybe Matt said it, that this is the continuation, that this has always been God's intention, um, that this isn't a, a, a Jesus idea, that this isn't a New Testament idea. Um, um, but Caroline, the reason that I called your name out is because you made a statement when we were talking about the Canaanite woman as a reminder that um, the, the Israelites had oppressed the Canaanites. And so what are the reasons that ancient Israel runs finds themselves in exile? I mean, how do we wind up with the front end of Isaiah's prophecy? We wind up because they haven't been doing what is right. They haven't been maintaining justice. They haven't been treating the foreigners well. And they... Even the people of God are called to account for that failure. But God's promise remains the same for Israel to be a blessing for everybody else. And so that promise here, post-exile, is maintained, but the expectation is the same. Pra do what is right. Practice justice. And gather, gather the outcasts, gather the others. Yeah. That's what justice looks like. Well, Psalm 67 fits in nicely here. I nice. made a segue to a psalm. I love I this psalm. It's one of my favorite yes. psalms because it's only seven verses. I can get through it. <laughs> and people want to sing the long ones that I start to get worried. But <laughs> but again, this idea of the peoples, right? God's <laughs> promises for the peoples. I would use this, speaking of a blessing, I mean, it is, <laughs> I would use this as a blessing. Yeah. What does I that would mean? Use this liturgically. <laughs> what does that mean? Use it as a blessing. Yeah, I would use it as the at the end of the service. 
Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Let the nations be glad. Sing for joy. Yep. You could Nudge do it. Equity. You could do it as a litany or something, but mm-hmm. but yeah, that's how I would use it. As it would really sum up some of the things that we've talked about thematically already. And and yeah. So liturgically. It's, it's, no, it's it's all of the fullness. It's all of the promises fulfilled. Exactly. Uh, Genesis, we're, and then we're done with Genesis. Then we move on to Exodus. This is our last, last reading from Genesis. We should make note of that if you're working through the semi-continuous and, reading. And, and what an incredible end, right? So um, we we shifted from the story of Jacob with all of its dysfunction to tell the story of his son, that one favored son, um, and the worst of the worst can happen to him, happens to him. And here at the end, we have this incredible gesture, this incredible gesture where Joseph says, come closer, see me, know who I am. I am your brother, the one you did that horrible thing to. And the reason that you've had all of this goodness which I'm going to keep bestowing on to you is because the God that I believed in, the God who gave me this dream, and, and I want to say this with echoes of Martin Luther King all the way through it. You may, you may seek to destroy me, but the God who gave me this dream for a beloved community, for uh, blessing the nations, for providing food for those who are hungry. Um, yes, hear the echoes of all the text. In the in this this culminating scene, um, where Joseph absolutely cannot contain himself to be able to tell them, "I am the one," and 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 wow, only the Spirit of God can bring that kind of that kind of forgiveness, that kind of reconciliation after such a long dysfunctional story. <laughs> uh. Yeah. And you think of the choices that were before Joseph, right? Uh, revenge, ongoing hatred, rejection of reconciliation. Um, and and then this is the choice he makes. And so, yeah, sure. it's pretty powerful. Anything else on that? Romans? Romans 11. Again, this is, there so, we are. This is some of the places where Paul is now trying to bring this argument to a close, right? So has God rejected God's people? By no means. It's emphatic, strong negation, right? That meganoita and the Greek students love learning about that. Yep. No way you can say no uh, more strongly. Um, and then to jump ahead, right? The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Yeah. And so, again, I'm not sure Paul entirely knows what's going on. I think he even admits that. Um, and, but he insists that it's going to end in mercy, uh, for all. And then, uh, and Mary Shore in her commentary points to this as well, where we have, um, uh, a, you know, doxology at the very end of chapter 11 as, as well, that Paul is finally hands all this over, uh, to the goodness of God. And it's a, it's a really well-written commentary on, yes. on the website. So certainly should uh, should look at that. And she also gives advice for how to make this not just simply a window into a, a first century debate, mm-hmm. but to ask the question of what does this mean about the, the quote unquote chosen becoming self-impressed uh, and the way we also construct bad images, bad characterizations of who God is. And so... And I also appreciated the her last paragraph of the commentary, and I, I would point our listeners to that, that I am not arguing here for an easy retreat to the realm of mystery when, when theological thinking gets hard for the preacher or the people. You know, we just, oh, well, it's the mystery of God. It's a mystery of God. Uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 are demonstrative of not giving into the mystery of God and just, I mean, nine, 10 and 11 wouldn't, wouldn't exist if Paul 
said, well, it's all a mystery. And no, it's doing that hard theological thinking together uh, to, to imagine what, you know, what, what God is doing through, through Jesus. And, uh, and I'm arguing that the wideness of God's mercy and the things God can redeem along the way to showing that mercy to all are beyond our comprehension. And that kind of claim here and that kind of helping people think about that, I think is, I think is very, very timely uh, to, you know, to acknowledge that, that what God is, what God is doing um, is, is beyond our comprehension, but that doesn't mean we stop thinking. It doesn't mean we stop talking and dialoguing about that. We, uh, we engage in that, uh, we engage in that hard work together. Um, Yeah. So that we don't shut down, so that we don't shut down God's mercy. So this is where hindsight is 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 so important because, you know, we keep talking about as you've just done, Caroline, the character of God, and ultimately all of this is so that we might know who God is and what God is doing in the world. And so you 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 when you know where you're going, that explains the journey. So if if someone is speeding, and you know they're going off to the hospital that's a little bit different than just someone who is, you know, being reckless. Um, uh, if someone gets off the path, but it's so that they can avoid a collision, that's very different than someone that is being obstinate. And, and so what, what we have here in, uh, in, in how we've looked at Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 um, is knowing where Paul is going in terms of um God is faithful. God is consistent. God is trustworthy. God is not breaking God's promise. By no means is God rejecting God's people. And here I'm, I'm really, um, drawn to Scott McKnight's, um, um, reading Romans backwards, a, a book that just came out. Um, because it's this sense of knowing where Paul is going by reading Romans end helps us understand all of Romans. And so what if you've preached, if you're preaching through Romans, where you are here should be consistent with what you've said all along the way. Because at the end of the day, this is a God who is good, who is faithful, and by no means is rejecting his people or breaking his promises. <music>